Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Thursday, January 19th, 2012, and our special guest today is Henry Eyring, co-author of The Innovative University. Welcome, Henry. It's great to be here. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for taking the time. We're glad to have you here. Future of Education is sponsored by my Web 2.0 Labs project and by Blackboard Collaborate and the WeCollaborate.com user group that I run. Coming up at ISTE, if you haven't been to ISTE, it's a blast, and we do ISTE Unplugged, a full set of sort of crowdsourced activities that take place throughout the conference, starting with Social EdCon, the all-day unconference on Saturday before ISTE. Go to ISTE Unplugged to learn more. Lots and lots of fun things to do. Uh, this past week, we started Ed Incubator, a space for startups and tech startups and others to uh, talk to authentic teacher councils in conjunction with Classroom 2.0. So it's edincubator.com. PBS NewsHour is the first group uh, taking advantage of this resource. If you'd like to let them know, uh, give them feedback about their uh, school journalism projects, please go to Classroom 2.0, click on Ed Incubator at the top, and click on PBS NewsHour. We are uh, celebrating the fifth anniversary of Classroom 2.0 this year, and we're planning on doing a big virtual conference. So we'll send more information about that as we know about it. We've set April 26 for the Gaming and Education Conference. Uh, the Alternative Education Conference will be May 10th through 12th. The second Library 2012 Conference, this is the Future of Libraries Conference, will be October 3rd to the 5th. And that'll be co-sponsored by San Jose State University again. And then the Global Education Conference, the five-day, 24-hour-day event, is November 12th to 16th. Lots of fun. I've spent the last uh, three days at Stanford uh, with a group from Finland talking about education. And it looks like we're going to do a Learning 2.0 conference at Stanford. So lots more fun coming up. Coming up on the Future of Education interview series, next week Lee Crockett talks to us about his book, Literacy is Not Enough, Cable Green from Creative Commons comes on to talk about the obviousness of open policy. David Lurcher comes back on the show to talk about learning commons, libraries, and personal learning environments. We have lots of fun on this list coming up. Uh, David Weinberger is relatively new on the list. Uh, Howard Rheingold on his new book, NetSmart, coming out. Joseph Grenny from Vital Smarts is going to talk about uh, change, really, really fun models from their uh, best-selling books. And then Jennifer Fox <laughs> from Texas will irreverently tell us that content is not as important as we think it is. If you've missed the show, uh, last night, uh, Tuesday night, Cheryl Nussbaum Beach came on to talk about The Connected Educator. Last week, Mitch Perlstein talked about the fragmented family and the elephant in the room, that discussion about family impact on education. Ian Jukes talked about just about everything. Scott McLeod about leadership. They're all up on the futureofeducation.com website with full Illuminate versions in MP3 formats. So this is when we let you tell us where you're listening from. To the left of the whiteboard now, you should see some icons. The second one down is a star. You have to click on that twice, but then you can click on the map. This year, as many of you know, I'm in Park City, Utah, but today I'm in Mountain View, California, having spent an enjoyable afternoon at Google uh, talking about search literacy, which was lots of fun. So it looks like we're an America-centric audience. Someone from South America there. Help me with my geography. Give a shout out and let us know. Bogota, Colombia, welcome. So we do have a, an OWL of 2.0 network uh, out of Colombia with Tomas. Um, OWL20.com, really fun group. Oh, New Zealand has joined us. Thanks for being here. Wherever you're listening from, and again, if you're listening to the recordings, thanks so much. We're glad to have you participating. Oops. A little bit of user error there. Okay, so uh, uh, a couple of things I need to say before we start the show. Uh, Henry, the first is that I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which connects you and me, although we've never talked before. Mm -hmm. um, and I previously did an interview with uh, on BYU-Idaho uh, to look at the learning model after Anya Kamenetz had profiled uh, BYU-Idaho in her book uh, DIYU. Yeah. which was um, a, a lot of fun. Um, 
I'm expecting tonight that it will be very easy for me to slip into religious titles as we talk about some individuals. So for those of you who are listening, I apologize for that in advance, but um, th uh, that may be the case. Um, you've written a couple of other books, one of which I want to ask you about before we start, and that was Major Decisions, Taking Charge of Your College Education. Can you kind of give an overview of what that book was about? Well, in essence, it was about the mistakes that I made as a college student and a graduate student. And uh, it really, I think, led naturally into the innovative university. Uh, but, uh, but going back, just to explain that comment, I majored in geology at BYU, the main campus in Provo. When I started in 1981, oil was selling for $30 a barrel. When I graduated, it briefly dipped to $8 a barrel in 1985. And that exposed the weaknesses, uh, some of the weaknesses, in, in not only me but my education. And got me thinking about um, what I think most students don't realize, and that is that it's not enough simply to be admitted to an outstanding institution of higher education to pick a good solid major and to get good grades. There's more to it than that. And in the book, I make the point that you essentially, even at the best of institutions and with the best of faculty, you have to be the general contractor of your own education. So Cal Newport came on the show. He had written a book called How to Be a High School Superstar. And uh, you know, essentially sort of looking at what I think is uh, maybe the same message but told in a different way and it's the importance of um, kind of determining what you care about and engaging in an environment that typically uh, gives you the impression that you need to conform in order to succeed. That wasn't the story I don't think 20 years ago or 25 years ago. Um, I mean I, I agree with you. I'm not sure I feel like I did a really good job with my own college education but I also think that that was kind of expected that my being personally entrepreneurial wasn't necessarily the norm. No, I think that's true. Um, you know, in, in the uh, information age and the knowledge economy in which we live, it's all the more important for a student to take a hard look at, um, I think what we only recognize in hindsight is being the academic traditions that surrounded us in college. Uh, the, the idea that, uh, for instance, I was majoring in geology, it never occurred to me to ask, well, what are you preparing me to do? And the answer that all of my professors gave when I finally asked, unable to get full-time employment, is they said, well, no, we're not preparing you for full-time employment. We were preparing you for a master's degree in geology. And that you know, may or may not be the right default uh, design criterion. But it, it, it definitely was, and most majors have that default uh, design criterion, and very, very few students think to ask and to take responsibility. And I think there's a little bit of collusion on, on the part of most students because they, they don't know what they want to be when they grow up, and it's easier to defer that tough question and simply say, well, I'll pick a major and I'll do well in the major. I think this also ties to a story of culture, and I'm, and I'm interested to kind of drill down on that as we get further into the book material. But, you know, it felt to me, my, you and I both had fathers who were prominent in education. So my dad was dean of admissions at Stanford. He was chairman of the college board. He went on to be dean of admissions at Princeton. Your dad, was, he was president of Rick's College, wasn't he? Yes, and prior to that was at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, which is where I was born. So you and I have that tie as well. But uh, at the time, the culture was a culture of a certain, the, the culture viewed achievement academically in a certain way that was uh, relatively pervasive. And that has the result of a, a sort of a common narrative that's easy to define. Part of what I find interesting about this conversation tonight is I don't feel like we have, <coughs> have that same consensus narrative right now. We're at a place where we're struggling to understand the role of teaching and learning within the context of the internet and the larger explosion of information. So I'm hopeful that we kind of drill down on that a little tonight. Um, is this a moment when we can really be rethinking higher education? Well, the answer is yes in, in two ways. First of all, 
it's a moment when we need to be rethinking higher education because almost all institutions uh, face the need to make some changes and I'll cite uh, even Harvard University. I was very impressed that uh, President Drew Faust in her introduction to Harvard's latest financial statements uh, cited the need for Harvard to change and specifically said that uh, uh, the, the three largest sources of revenue for Harvard, which are endowment earnings, federal research funding, and tuition, are all at their limit in terms of what Harvard can ask. And in most, if not probably all three of those cases, uh, at least cer certainly with federal research funding and endowment earnings, They've got to be expected to fall, at least in the near term. So in answer, part of the answer to your question is it's a time when we need, uh, all, all institutions need to be rethinking higher education. And the good news is that I think we can, we can do it thoughtfully. There's a question as to how quickly disruption will come to higher education, but I think that there is a good case to be made that it won't come as quickly as it did to the, the newspapers. I have a dear friend, Clark Gilbert, who's featured in the book and was one of my colleagues here at BYU-Idaho and before that at the Harvard Business School with Kim Clark. Uh, he is is now running uh, the Deseret News uh, and, and a, a subsidiary he's created called Deseret Digital Media. And I believe him when he tells me that the most profitable year ever for the newspaper industry was 2006, immediately followed by what we've, we've seen happening there. And so uh, th there's, a, there's a risk that disruption sweeps higher education in a similarly quick and cataclysmic fashion. But I think it probably won't be the case. And, and I think there's time then to be thoughtful. It's necessary to, th to rethink higher education, and there's time to be thoughtful about it. So uh, for the purposes of the understanding the context of the book, your co-author, uh, Clay Christensen, had a stroke at some point during the writing of the book. So his theories are highly influential in the book. It feels as though maybe you wrote the bulk of the material. Well, I did. Uh, I did a take on most of the writing duties, um, working on the basis of Clay's theories, and uh, especially my understanding of, of BYU Idaho. Uh, intellectually, I, I don't think I can claim an even division of labor. Uh, Clay really was the the leader on the project. Okay. Well, I didn't want to make any assumptions, but. As I read the book, uh, um, I, I, I heard a distinction between a disruptive innovation and a sustaining innovation. And I'm not as familiar with, the, the, with Clay's business theories, but it felt to me like the position of the book was, this is a moment of, of innovation and of change, but this could actually be a sustaining innovation for universities and colleges rather than a disruptive innovation. Yeah, I think the, the the argument for that is to, you know, you, there's there's sort of a spectrum, and it's fun to think about. At least for me, it's fun to think about uh, industries on one end of the spectrum, such as news media, which I just mentioned, or uh, the distribution of movies and music, where the disrupt the disruption came very quickly and and very painfully, just turned the world on its head. At the other end of the spectrum, there are some thing, things that don't change much, and one of the industries that Clay has studied in this regard is the hospitality industry, and specifically hotels. Um, the, the Ritz is the Ritz, the Four Seasons is the Four Seasons, and uh, the spectrum is, is created then uh, by differences in the nature of the product and especially the degree to which it can be changed with new technology. Uh, and, and yet my view of it is that if you look at higher education, it's probably somewhere in the middle between uh, Blockbuster and Hollywood Video on the one hand and the, the Ritz and the Four Seasons on the other. There's a great deal of what higher education does, which is uh, uh, d depends upon the prestige of the institution. 
certifying uh, some educational outcomes that frankly are quite hard to quantify, some of which may always be hard to quantify. There's also the quality of place. So in a way, if you know, we, we all, if we have our preference, I think would go literally go to college. And so in a way, traditional colleges and universities have got a hotel embedded inside of them. And uh, they are also providing activities uh, that uh, have got a sort of, if you will, a resort quality to them. And uh, even, uh, you, you know, you, you think of the, the intercollegiate athletics may not sound very important to us now that we're older, but when we were 17 or 18, the idea of going to college, being on a physical campus, having some very expensive, hard to, to, to provide, hard to distant intermediate face-to-face -face activities, I, I think that means that we'll probably see higher education being in, a, in the middle of that disruption spectrum where if colleges and universities, if institutions are willing to adopt the new technology, that they can turn it into a sustaining innovation and avoid being disrupted. So Michael Horn's been on the show a couple of times talking about disrupting class. Uh, I, I like your description of the university and some of the elements that might lead it to, to not being fully disruptive. But could the same be claimed for K-12 as well? You know, it's a really good question. It's it's beyond my expertise, although I, I, I highly recommend uh, Isaac Asimov's most famous short story. It's called The Fun They Had, written in 1951. So we've, we've just passed the 50-year anniversary. And it's really it just it's a display of Asimov's brilliance because in 1951, uh, the digital computer was very much in its infancy. Network television was only a year or two old. But Asimov's lead character, who lives in 2150 or so, uh, a young girl along with a friend, discover the first book they've ever seen. And they marvel at the way the book, as you turn the pages, you turn back and the page still looks the same. They find that very novel. And the book significantly tells the story of a school. And they've never heard of a school where you go and you gather in groups. And the, the young girl, upon reflecting on this, uh, contrasts that with the, the automated teacher, the robotic teacher that she has in her home. And, and, and initially, she's, she's got these feelings of, well, and shares them with her young friend. Well, how, how in the world could a human teacher ever perform as well as my robotic teacher? And wouldn't it be a burden to me to have to learn at the pace of other students? Um, and so she completely dismisses the idea that there could be something to have through gathering with students and learning from a human teacher and being influenced by the pace of the group. And, and then upon further reflection, uh, she begins to ask this question, well, wouldn't it have been fun? Would, didn't they have fun when they gathered and they could teach one another and learn from one another? And so I think it goes back to this, uh, this idea of a spectrum where if you can, you'd, you'd, you'd have it all, whether it's in second uh, uh, K through 12 education or higher education, I, I, at least what I would prefer for myself and for my children will, would be the best of both elements. Great gathering experiences, wonderful face-to-face -face teachers, probably in kind of an inverted classroom model where uh, the lecture is something we viewed at home and we gather then for to work the homework problems and better yet, to do, to do highly creative things together. I, I think that's the, the, the future that to me seems most palatable and I think that technology will bring that experience down to a reasonable cost. What you've described uh, 
resonates with my own perceptions as well. Um, we've talked on the show before about the, the different images we have of, of education in the future based on science fiction. And one is that you stand in front of a machine and it kind of dumps everything into your brain. And the other are these images of very Socratic teaching and very natural circumstances that were, were the higher, more evolved thoughtfulness is, is evident. Um, partly for me it feels as though we have a hard time distinguishing between knowledge and practice and that the two can be acquired in very different ways that that there are things there's content knowledge that we need to learn that that comes in a lecture format but but learning the practice of something really requires social interaction and it feels as though that's kind of the part of the social viewpoint of the value of the university oh i think that's it's so true and and again where we get where we get older uh, we we tend to look back on some of those crucial socialization experiences. You know, the the roommate you couldn't stand, uh, the the professor uh, with whom you never quite clicked, and I think you can forget how important it was to experience those things and the learning that came, that then enhanced subsequent relationships. Uh, and, uh, and 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 having forgotten that, we we might, may find ourselves looking at, at what the web brings us and say, well, I can see the, the this straight line between the, the two points between where I am now, what I don't know, and where I want to be, the knowledge I want to acquire, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it's it's probably got to be considered in light of the socialization experiences, especially that young people need to have and that uh, are almost impossible to achieve along a straight line. Okay, so um, what, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up playing with this idea about the difference between disrupting class and innovative university, I'm sure, for a few days in my own mind. Um, but uh, it does feel as though the innovative university um, has a little bit more of a pedagogical uh, viewpoint. Disrupting class felt to me like we're not making it, we're not drawing any conclusions here. But if you look at the the adoption of online learning, it's following a pattern that very much fits the disruptive technology model. And what can we extrapolate from that? It feels like the innovative university does carry a little bit of a desire to preserve. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think that's fair, and I probably have to do a, a mea culpa there. Although um, Clayton said it this way, I think it was it was generous of him that uh, one of the things he likes about the Innovative University is the first is that it's the first of his books in which there is there's a real case study. Um, now the the problem with a case study is that uh, coming as it did in 2011, and we're really writing about things that had happened in 2008, and 2009, and 2010. It is it is only halfway to the future, and so I, I would grant that what we're going to see is a lot of change, even at traditional institutions, especially at at some of the for-profit institutions. But yes, I, I'll take uh, I'll take responsibility for having drawn really upon uh, my own learning experiences and, and looking back and saying, look, most of what I realized, what I learned not only wasn't quantifiable, it, I didn't even realize it until much later in my life. And we talked earlier about major decisions. I think it was the writing of that book that um, prepared me to, to carry that same viewpoint over to the Innovative University. Now, also to Clay's credit, he he reawakened me um, to to that memory uh, in a conversation where he had where he said you know I've just come back from a meeting of Bowdoin alumni and uh, I asked them what what is it that makes you feel tied to to Bowdoin and grateful for what uh, happened to you when you were there and he was of course speaking of the whole educational experience but he said that almost to a person these grateful alumni would talk about a particular individual. And, uh, and then that really, uh, Clay gets the credit for, for t helping me tie then that book, Major Decisions, which highlights, I, I sort of pay homage to uh, the six or seven or eight of the, the professors I loved best in college and who affected me most. 
uh, uh, Clay helped me make the connection, and I, th it's, I think it's a connection that I, I, I would stand by um, for all we're going to do technologically. Um, I, re I really think that we'll find that that just enhances the kind of personal relationships that students can have with great teachers. I'm going to spend the next week mapping those thoughts against the K-12 environment. It's going to be a, a fascinating time for me. Okay, I love that. Interested in it. Um, I want, for the benefit of the audience and those listening, I want to talk a little bit about disruptive technologies. And as I made kind of a list of why disruptive technologies don't get adopted by the core institution or organization. I came up with three that I felt were valid and one that I felt was invalid. And I, and I wonder, I'm, when I get to that, I'm wondering if universities are particularly in that area. So it seems to me valid that the core institution or industry uh, or organization would have a hard time knowing which of the many innovations is actually going to change the game. Mm. So you're not going to bet the farm on, on one of them. It seems to me valid that those innovations aren't as profitable yet. And so you're, you're going to wait till, the, till they reach a profitability level. And it seems to me that there are innovations that take place that you just don't have any control over. Mm. Um, like you know, when refrigeration came and the people who made the ice, you know, the, the, there were innovations that they just couldn't control and couldn't adopt. But one reason I think that, that the core sometimes doesn't embrace the innovation is hubris. Mm. And it feels to me as though universities are particularly vulnerable in this area. How do you address that? Well, so let me take the, the easier part of this, which is to support what you said about the, the valid reasons. Um, so, for instance, choosing innovations. If you look, and, and this is something that my colleague, uh, my boss actually, Kim Clark, who's the president of BYU-Idaho and former dean of the Harvard Business School, has pointed out to me, and, and that is that Harvard, uh, for example, is going to be very careful not to stub its toe. And frankly, some of its peers have stubbed their toes, adopted quickly uh, online learning, for example, and, and rushed headlong in only to discover that the technology was still evolving and was still shifting. And so there's a pretty good argument that, that it is valid to say, hey, look, before we change a student's educational experience, you know, if we get it wrong for a period of three or four years, that's the whole education uh, of a student. So let's be careful not to, to jump in while things are sh still shifting. And I think Harvard is a great example of an institution that is, is, is investing in online education, learning a lot, especially through its executive education programs, uh, but you know, has not cast the die for the rest of, of the uh, curriculum. And I, I, I actually think on the point of, of profit, um, you know, in, in the case of online learning, I think most schools can see, look, when this works, it's going to increase our profit. It's going to decrease our costs and increase the number of students we can serve. So uh, I, I think that there are, 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 as you say, there are valid reasons to be cautious especially if you're a university president and you're responsible for the reputation of the institution. Now, hubris is real, and at the faculty level, it can be a particular challenge. Um, you know, the whole notion of academic freedom extends, I think, in the minds of many faculty members, not only, uh, it applies not only to in their research, but in the way they conduct the classroom. And, and, and there's, I think, a frankly, a justified feeling of wanting to control the whole learning experience. And even to give up pieces where it may seem like, well, you know, couldn't, couldn't we do, couldn't we put the lecture online, for instance? I think there's, it's reasonable for faculty members to push back and say, well, wait a minute, how's this going to affect the overall experience? And at BYU-Idaho, we assume the burden as administrators and those responsible for developing online course materials and online courses, we, we assume the burden of showing how uh, what, what we're doing can enhance what the full-time faculty are, are, have al already been doing so well. And that takes time. And it's one of the reasons that we, I don't think we will see 
uh, very rapid adoption in higher education, even by the schools that are most committed to it, I, I think it's going to take some time to, to bring the faculty along, and, and it's worth doing if it, if it can be done right. So I want to give you a chance to talk about the sort of the, the complement contrast of BYU, Idaho, and Harvard, and kind of go into the story. But you've you've opened the door to this question of culture for me, and I find this really interesting. So the the last two days that I spent at Stanford were meeting with people from the Finnish education system and looking at uh, why Finland has you know so suddenly appeared at the top of these lists of achievement. And, and what's interesting about it is that they didn't intend to be at the top of the list. They're not even sure they're comfortable at the top of the list for very good reasons. That they worry about the, um, you know, how it changes their own perception of themselves. But they they appeared at the top of those achievement lists because they focused on a core objective, and the core objective for them was equity. And it allowed their culture to come together and define. Uh, something where all the stakeholders felt an interest in accomplishing this, and the end result was they created a culture around education that then produced energy and interest and enthusiasm. I, I, I left that set of meetings not convinced that it had to be equity necessarily. In fact, I think uh, the state of Utah's focus on immersive language programs may do the same thing, bring people together. But I'm wondering about this model of um, coming together around an idea, around a, a, a driving belief culturally in, in what can happen. And um, uh, I feel as though that's definitely happened at BYU-Idaho. Do you want to describe that a little? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was quite remarkable that in in 2000, when the economy was doing very, very well and uh, enrollments were up, uh, quite remarkable that that uh, my predecessors here were able to to rally this institution uh, around a, a reinvention of itself. Uh, we refer to it as changing of the DNA of the university. And um, and to be quite honest, that w it was a matter of, of religious commitment. This is a religious institution. The people who've come here have come, have, have always come because they're committed to to teaching. They're committed to to creating a special kind of environment. Many of them are graduates, or were, at that time were were graduates of of what was Rick's College, and so it was. Uh, there was an opportunity that I think was unique, and frankly. Uh, it, very hard to replicate, um, but it is not so different from the kinds of rallying that we we need to st start to see uh, as a result of the uh, financial challenges that most institutions are facing. So funding is being cut off, new competitors are arising, questions are being asked about um, learning performance. And so I, I think that I'm, I see a, a blessing in that, frankly, because uh, hubris is real if, in, in all industries, but uh, in, you know, in higher education, where especially in the United States, we can claim for a hundred years to have been world-leading and fundamental to to the economic miracle. Uh, of the of the 20th century, I, I, it, I think it's a it's a blessing. We're fortunate to have hit uh, this difficult time, where we are all going to come together, like it or not. We're going to have conversations about what to do, and uh, perforce that means what to do differently. And uh, I, I really think that the, it, there's a view of this, and we try to take it in the book that's that's optimistic. It says this is not so very different from what Harvard did under Charles Eliot, or also 40 years later under Lawrence Lull, even really James Conan. That's part of the, the, the thing I loved about the Harvard story is that Harvard has, has been very good at reinventing itself, uh, sometimes by choice, sometimes when it was forced to by economic conditions or war. But that, there's a tradition of coming together and saying, how could we do this better? And uh, I think if we will remember that, that higher education tradition and look at this as not a zero-sum game, that the new technology will allow us to serve more students, 
to employ more faculty. Right now, there's a, a huge uh, an, an imbalance. Um, it just it makes no sense for us to have so many young people who'd like to go to college but are finding it difficult to afford. So many faculty members, PhD holding, uh, you know, highly credentialed, capable faculty members who can't find full-time positions. How do we make that equation clear? The answer is to step back from the traditional model, um, to to embrace the new technologies that are available. And what we can see is universities that are serving more students at a price they can afford and, uh, and engaging more faculty in ways that are uh, rewarding for them, maybe probably even more so than, than the kinds of lectures they've been delivering in, uh, in, in large lecture halls. And so I, I, I think there's, there's good reason to believe that uh, good things are on the horizon. So I'm going to push back just a little and play with an idea. So uh, you tell the story in the book of uh, the president of the LDS Church, uh, Gordon B. Hinckley, making the announcement uh, about the change uh, from Ricks being a two-year college to a four-year college. And you point out, I think quite thoughtfully, that, uh, you know, that there was a religious conformance element here which wouldn't be present in a lot of non-religious schools. You know, willingness to go along with the decision because the leader of the church is asking you to do so. In Finland, they have a long Lutheran tradition, and they also have a tradition of being a country that's unified because of outside uh, forces and concerns. Mm -hmm. um, in Utah, there are you know, a high number of members of our church who come back from uh, LDS missions with language skills, and there is a sort of an easy narrative around the value of second languages and having immersive language programs. I, I'm not hearing the same compelling narrative for higher education. I'm hearing sort of thoughtful sort of responses about the, the measured value, but I'm not hearing the same compelling story. What am I missing? Is there a story that, that, the, that all of the constituencies could gather around at this point, or are we in the position of waiting for that compelling story to come? Well, that's a good question, and it, it, it can't all come perforce, uh, obviously. It, it, it can't be a matter of, of uh, you know, the budget's being cut. Now we've got to make some uh, decisions together and, and achieve a, a new level of un unity around a, a new mission. But, you know, I, I, I think I'll, I'll give you an example. I was at the University of Tennessee this fall. Um, and I don't want to uh, misquote the data, but as, as I heard it, I, I, I was told that uh, the state of Tennessee uh, spends a very small percentage of its state budget on higher education, and uh, the economy is not doing well there. And so the University of Tennessee is, is facing some significant pressures. But as I met with that group of people, and I don't know, that, to my knowledge, there's no religion at play. Uh, but there is a spirit of there's a volunteer spirit, and of, of of people pulling together not only around the institution but around the craft. If you, if you think about it, I mean, it's on the one hand you can paint a tenured faculty member as being uh, selfish, not interested in the classroom relative to his or her own research, you know, trying to minimize the number of hours they work. Uh, and while that may or may not be a real portrayal, it certainly isn't the way uh, the, the people get into this business, so to speak. Um, the, the, the folks who, who, who go into higher education almost all do it with the thought that they're going to be making less than they could otherwise, given their uh, level of education and intelligence. Um, but there are factors such as the love of learning, the love of discovery, the love of sharing those discoveries that are countervailing. And I think it, there's a religious quality to that. Now, we have a higher education model um, borrowed from Harvard uh, that has a tendency to, to squeeze some of those initial motivations down and in some cases almost entirely out. Um, so if you get into a uh, a rank and tenure 
pro process that is all about research publication, um, and you've got a school that's trying to climb in rankings, that's going to produce um, some undesirable behaviors, and it's going to become embedded in the in the culture and in the in, in the, the the way classes are taught. Uh, you'll you'll go to large, very large classes to get the teaching done, so you can go off to do your research, so you get promoted and you know, don't lose your job. Um, the, the, I think I, I just look at the thing and 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 think that there is real reason to believe that we've got the right people on almost every campus um, to come together and and take a look at the opportunities that, that are presented by new technologies and the, the need to provide more higher education. Uh, and I, it's, it's just impossible for me not to, to uh, preach a message of, of optimism. Yeah, I hope you're right. And I think the technology story may be a part of the key to this. But I also think that unlike a consensus culture, our culture tends to be one where we see value coming out of competing interests. And somehow uh, it seems to me we have to get past that to a story that actually brings us together. Because that's where I've seen, uh, or at least my sort of early mental models are, of how sort of larger educational change takes place. Hmm. Um, I want to give you the chance to kind of wave the flag. Um, at the start of Chapter 20, you talk about new models. And I want to give you a chance to talk about BYU-Idaho sort of as a learning model. And, and you know, sort of the, the magic wand, if you, were, if you were reshaping some portion of higher ed, what can we learn from BYU-Idaho? What would the practices be, and what are the practices of BYU-Idaho that feel that they're very much kind of forward thinking and, and do address some of the real needs? Well, I think you've hit on a key one, and that is to, to view technology as being good for both faculty and students. Um, and, and while technology it does cause disruption, even a sustaining innovation is going to require um, faculty members and, and students to change the way they've traditionally done things. Um, there's a I think there's a very uh, strong argument that what we're going to see is um, teachers doing more of what they like to do, which is to engage students in higher order thinking. Um, students come into class better prepared. We see that here at BYU-Idaho um, where even in freshman courses where, uh, where our faculty members are applying what we call the BYU-Idaho learning model. Um, that, that means it's just simple stuff. It looks quite a lot like what happens at, at the graduate level in business schools and law schools. And that is before you come to class, um, you've, you've made not only individual preparations, but off, often group preparations. Uh, the, some of that can be done online now, so where you, you've, you've viewed the lecture online and or you've read the textual materials, you're talking with your colleagues. It's really fun to be a, a faculty member in that environment. I've, I've had the experience where you, you get to see the discussion among the students, then you arrive in the classroom and you know, in the day that I went, the days that I went to business school and law school, they talked about cold calling. You were always afraid you'd be cold called. And the exciting thing now is that as a faculty member, I can do a warm call. I I, I see how the students have been debating the issues or the problems that we're going to be discussing that day, and I can almost like an orchestra conductor. I can you know I can call on the string section. And, uh, and start a conversation that just takes us to a new level. So even with very young undergraduate students in our introductory courses, um, we're having the kinds of conversations that I remember as uh, you know, a law school 3L in, in, in the third year or a second year MBA student. Um, so, so really fun things happening there that aren't unique to BYU-Idaho, but it is uh, it is a combination of a real focus on learning and not only focusing one's time, so um, we, we, uh, we don't have the traditional research-based uh, tenure model here, but also focusing one's thought about how learning occurs best, and that's embodied in our learning model, and then using technologies 
to facilitate that that learning model and really fun, rewarding things can happen in the classroom for both students and faculty. And there's more to the story than that too. I mean, there's the internship uh, uh, support and in, in the program. There's the sort of change in the schedule. Um, are, are there other things you'd want to point out here that are innovations that are really sort of distinguishing the experience for the students? Yeah, uh, I think uh, yeah, it's two things maybe worth noting. One is that we we view all students as participants all the time. So uh, in the in the classroom, part of our one of the principles of our learning model is that we we teach one another. So a student is expected to be a teacher. The same thing is true in our student activities. We eliminated intercollegiate athletics, and in their place, what we have now, you know, we, we eliminated one good junior college football team, and now every fall we have three or four teams playing in full pads on a, on a uh, football field where we, we use it so much we had to replace the, the, the grass field with artificial turf. And uh, we've got it's over now 200 of these student-led activities where the coaches are students, the league administrators are students. Um, students, you know, they 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 begin as participants and they move up uh, through these uh, le leadership positions. And so it it is all about whatever you're doing here, uh, you're, you're a teacher. As a student, uh, you're you're not just an observer; you're a participant. Yeah, brilliant. I, mean, I just have to say, I really love all that's being done there. Okay, this is the portion of the show where we switch to Q and A. Uh, I have some additional questions. If if we if the, this is a little bit of a smaller audience, but if you've put a question in the chat that didn't get answered, please feel free to post it again. I oftentimes just miss them; uh, hard to. Find. Follow, um, or you can also raise your hand to take the microphone if you'd like. That's the third icon over in the participant window. It's a raised hand icon. Click on that, and I'll give you the microphone. Um, I, uh, there were some criticisms of the book. I read the Amazon reviews. Were, were any of them on target? And do you feel like if you were rewriting the book today, you would do anything different? Um. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to make a confession. Uh, I stopped reading the Amazon reviews pretty early on. Um, my ego couldn't take it. That was partly the reason, but partly I think what I saw was um, because there is this spectrum of of disruptability, and because this book really stakes out the middle ground. Um, what's then you're open to criticisms on on either end of the spectrum. And so there, there are many people who uh, have read Clay's earlier books and are, are, are convinced that disruption is the way things happen, uh, who, who called this half a loaf or a head in the sand effectively and said, you know, why aren't you, you know, why, why are you defending the traditional model? Uh, and uh, why aren't you talking about some of the very innovative possibilities now that that that, that are op open to us? And uh, I, I'm not I'm sure not sure I have a good answer to that except to say that we've we've made a guess and we have focused on young students. And so f for folks who say well it's going to be much more disruptive, um, that's very very likely to be true. Uh, for adult learners, Western Governors University is a great example of that, and I was fortunate to be involved at the founding and the initial strategy development for WGU. But Bob Mendenhall of WGU is the first to say what we do here uh, is is quite unique. It's suited for this purpose, this group of highly motivated adult learners. Um, for 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 them, it will work. So you, you know. Almost certainly, we're wrong about our prediction about the extent of change in traditional higher education and the pace. But I'd be willing to come back around in five or ten years, and I, I don't think I'd be embarrassed um, to to confront some of the folks who've said on Amazon, you, you know, this is this is uh, innovation 
I can't remember. There's a phrase, some, something about dis, disruption, in, innovation masked as disruption or something. Um, but so we'll, we'll be wrong. But 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 I think generally, if you were going to place a bet, I, I still think you ought to place place the bet with us. <laughs> okay, good answer. Uh, um, Durf has Lisa Durf has two questions. We'll start with her first. Um, she says uh, Everett Rogers wrote in the Diffusion of Innovations about the S curve. Where are we now on that S curve? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, uh, Clayton, I think in in uh, the uh, K through 12 book, Disrupting Class. Uh, at least I've seen it in his subsequent PowerPoint presentations. I think that's in the book, and he suggested we were about halfway there, and he was doing that several years ago. Um, I, I don't. I, I think I would give an answer that is, you know, I would say more nuanced, and, and uh, others, th those who hear it may say, is, is, is more hedged. Um, but I, I think that the, the the innovations are going to come in waves in learning because there's a certain kind of innovation that is is purely a matter of applying technologies we've got at hand. So online learning, for instance, that's where Clayton applied the S curve was to online courses being taken by high school students. But that's just going to w open up a whole bunch of new S curves as we think about as, as we learn things about cognitive science and we begin to marry the cognitive science with, with uh, communication technology. Um, I think that if you look at the big, big, the, the aggregation of S-curves, uh, I think that we are, we're very, very early into it. And uh, again, that's it's part of what drives my, my optimism. So, so Lisa has another question, but I'm going to intersperse with one. She's, she's just telling you an excellent answer. I don't know if you're following the chat, thank, but thank you. she'd like that answer. Um, what about these uh, accreditation, alternate accreditation efforts like MITx uh, providing potentially classes for thousands to tens of thousands with an alternate accreditation, or um, Stanford in the idea of robot grading? Um, are we going to see alternate ways of indicating that somebody has skills and values? Um, and, and do you want to shed a little bit of light on that from Western governors? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. And I think Western governors, it, it, you're right to point to Western governors because I did my initial consulting work there in the mid-90s. And there was a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money invested in just figuring out the theory of how you'd grant a degree. And I think it's pretty important to distinguish the difference between creating one course and and the learning objectives and the the tools for achieving those the tools and the exercises, building the curriculum around one course and building a college degree. Big, big difference. And not only did it take Western Governors University a long, long time to come up with the right theory of how you do that both intellectually and, in, and operationally, but they also had to decide, hey, look, if we're going to make this work, we can't be in the curriculum business. Um, and so they were, they were very careful about, about what they could and couldn't do. And, uh, uh, and so I, I just think for, for, for those who, who see or look at the enrollments in, in this particular course and can we imagine how it would be graded by a robot, particularly those institutions that are very prestigious and that are serving young students, they would do really well to step back and say, okay, if this is going to be an MIT certif certification uh, and, and, and it's going to be similar at least in quality, if not kind, to what we do. What does it really take? What does it really take to certify everything we think we can do for a student? And it's pretty complicated. It's complicated theoretically, and it's really complicated to build then the system. If you got 160,000 students, um, it's not all going to be done by by robot. And so what does is, what is your delivery system look like? What do your advising systems look like? Um, that's that's going to be complicated stuff. It's not to, to be discouraging, 
but I think it's going to turn out when when you when you look at it uh, to be not quite so scalable as as people think, to be not quite so inexpensive. It'll just be inaffordable. It won't be free. Uh, excuse me. It'll be affordable. And, and uh, I think there's a risk of missing the mark and saying, oh look, universities will go away. All of this will be robotic. All of this will be free. And, and you say, look, that's probably not going to happen, and it's not what's needed. We just need to use the technologies to make the, the degree affordable, more accessible, to raise its quality a bit. Well, so part of what I heard in the book was okay, there's going to be, uh, there's a need for, and there is value in the Harvard model. But, it, but, but all of these other, in, universities, the many, many universities that have tried to emulate the Harvard model, they're just not going to be able to continue to do that. It doesn't make sense financially or from the standpoint of, of what the students are going to need. So now there's this opportunity for schools to to be like BYU-Idaho, to kind of pick a learning model, to do something really well and effectively that matches the culture or interests of the, the students who want to attend, that really addresses specific needs. So if I've heard you correctly, the idea that MIT or Stanford would try and uh, to do more is probably not a good model for most schools. It's probably to actually focus down and do less. Well, it's true. And again, I'll go back to it's the key to the success of BYU-Idaho. It's the key to success of Bob Mendenhall and his colleagues at WGU. And that is that, that they, they picked a group of, of people they wanted to serve, uh, and they they focused on those people, and they brought all of their knowledge of, of learning to bear, but they basically ignored every other operating model and spent a fair amount of time thinking about, okay, if we really ignored what the rest of the world was doing um, uh, and we just wanted to serve this fairly uh, narrowly defined group of people, what would, what would we do for them? And if I had a message for uh, college and, and university administrators and faculty members, I would say that. I think it, it, that if you can forget about whatever it is that's distracting you, uh, you, you know, the, this, this, the school one step up the ladder from you in, in your state system, forget the ladder entirely and, and just say, um, who do we want, to, to, what, what constituencies do we want to serve? And that, by the way, may include the scientific community. You may decide you want to be engaged in research. You may decide you want to have uh, great intercollegiate athletic teams. But you ought to make that decision on the basis of, of who you want to be as an institution and not the way that others have, have made the decision. Okay, as a courtesy to our guests, we finish on time, so this is your final question. Uh, it's from Lisa again. Base university education on the community of inquiry model for a moment. Do you feel, Henry, that attention to cognitive presence, social presence, and teaching presence produce effective online teaching? Well, I feel that's a question I'm not qualified to, to, to answer. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't sure I was qualified to even read it. <laughs> um, I think so. There's a you know there's some comments being made about uh, about expertise. Um, I, I'll I'll default to to a, a balance. Um, there's wisdom in crowds. There is there are great opportunities in the clouds of of information out there. It's just it's, it's a fantastic thing that I think will add immeasurably to learning for students of all ages. But I, I, I can never get very far from the metaphor of Mark Hopkins and the log, uh, where James Garfield said so famously of the, the, the uh, president of Williams College, his mentor, the ideal college is, is a log with, with uh, Mark Hopkins on one end and a student on the other. Um, and I think that's a matter of both the personal qualities that that individual brings to bear, but also expertise. And the expertise does have to be broad. I hope this starts to answer the question. It's not only content knowledge, but it's the knowledge of the way people learn. It's the knowledge of, of, of socialization. And so I, I see a world in which we need, we need more tenured faculty members, not fewer. They need to be tenured for, uh, for the, the right things. Ernest Boyer's um, uh, schema, to me, I think has got a lot of merit where we're thinking about the scholarship of, 
of, of teaching and learning as well as the scholarship of discovery. And, uh, and so what I see are university communities probably even becoming stronger in some of what uh, you know came out of the Middle Ages and is what has always made them university communities, but being strengthened as they then tie into global networks of, of knowledge and, uh, uh, and information. Okay, very nice way to finish. Our guest has been Henry J. Eyring. The book is The Innovative University. Henry, thanks so much for coming on the show. My great pleasure. Thank you. Next week, Lee Crockett on Literacy is Not Enough and Cable Green on the Obviousness of Open Policy. Thanks, everybody. Good night. <laughs>